My name is Rachel Rose. I created this show because I wanted to help you see that if you have a choice, you can choose a better life. If you're listening to this podcast, you're in a pretty fortunate position. You have free will, the ability to connect to the internet, and access to all kinds of new education. This podcast is meant to help you make the most of your good fortune. We talk with all kinds of people here from all walks of life because I want you to see that no matter what your situation, there's always a way to create a life that you're proud of. Hello everyone, today we're here with Derek Rydell. Part of the new generation of spiritual visionaries and thought leaders, Derek Rydell is the author of Emergence, Seven Steps for Radical Life Change and the world's number one expert on the revolutionary law of emergence. He has trained top executives at Fortune 500 companies, from American Express to Disney, and empowered leadership and communications, coached celebrities and media professionals, including Oscar and Emmy winners, on creating conscious entertainment, regularly writes for the Huffington Post, and has touched hundreds of thousands around the planet with his message on finding your path, living your purpose, and making a powerful impact. In his weekly Best Year of Your Life podcast on iTunes, he reveals cutting-edge spiritual principles and success strategies to achieve financial freedom and abundance, master productivity and creativity, and gain true wealth and happiness. I originally came across Derek when his publicist reached out to me about him potentially coming on the show, and when I researched more about him, I felt that he could have so much to offer to everyone listening. It's obvious that he has being heart-centered down. On his blog, he mentions how he was seriously considering becoming a monk and then a minister and then a hardcore meditator, so he's very spiritual. But beyond this, he also gets the real-world practical results. He's trained executives in all of Fortune 500 companies. He's written scripts for places like Fox Studios, Universal, Disney, many more. So I feel like Derek will be able to share with us about how to blend head and heart in a way that doesn't compromise you and still get phenomenal results. He also says that he has the answers to getting things that you want with his law of emergence principle, which I'm excited to dig in with him. So this is going to be a great episode. I'm looking forward to the wisdom that Derek has to share with us. So Derek, thank you for being here. Thank you. It's truly my honor and pleasure to be here. So the intention behind the show, A Better Life, is to show people that if they have a choice, they can choose a better life. So in that spirit, can you take a minute? Yes. <laughs> yes. So can you take a minute to share some of the things that you're most proud of in your life? Oh, gosh. I mean, I guess it's funny. I'm staring at a picture right now of my two children. That would be my greatest creation. Talk about the power of emergence, which is what I teach. That would be my greatest creation. Is I thought that I was going to be teaching my kids so much, but it turned out the other way around. They have become my greatest teacher. But I'm also very inspired and very grateful. I don't know if you'd say proud, but just very grateful for how the work that I'm doing has touched so many people around the world and helped to set them free from the struggle of self-improvement and so a lot of the struggles that I lived that really got me here to teaching this. Awesome. And that was actually one of my biggest questions for you. So you say in your book, and you just said now, about how you don't really agree with the idea of self-improvement. I totally agree. So can you tell us, A, what you mean by this, and then also what led you to that belief? Because I know you have some fascinating stories that went on for you, including your two near-death experiences. And I just love for listeners to get to know kind of what happened to you for you to get to where you are now. Yeah, well, you know, like so many people, I was struggling to improve my life and fix my life and attract a better life and get over my bad childhood and, you know, all the different things that we do to try to make our life better. And the only thing that I improved after a decade of all of this self-improvement work was I improved my ability to describe why my life was so messed up, (laughs) you know. But I hadn't really improved my life. I I was just very eloquent and articulate at describing why it wasn't working. And, you know, the the whole struggle to, to improve my life actually drove me into becoming addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I almost died of an overdose. And then, again, I almost died from drowning. And I won't go into all the details in the story, but I basically reached a point when I almost drowned where I was stuck in a coral reef underwater. And I reached a moment where I knew I wasn't going to get out alive. And it's hard to understand the love, the finality that I experienced if you haven't been in that before. But I knew I was going to drown. And I was stuck underwater, surrounded by giant spiked coral and inches from my face and my throat and my chest. Any moment, it could have skewered me. And I was there for quite a long time, just trying to stay afloat at a certain level in the water so I wouldn't get skewered. And I reached a moment where I knew I wasn't, I had nothing left in me. I was going to, I was going to drown. 
and all that was left was to surrender. And I'd already tried bargaining with the universe, you know, saying, God, if you get me out of this, I'll go to church on Sunday, you know, that kind of thing. And the universe was not bargaining. I ultimately reached a point where all I could do was let go. And in that moment of letting go, something cracked open inside of me. First of all, this wave came and lifted me out of the pocket, and I was able to to jump onto a space outside of the pocket I'd been trapped in, and I could stand for the first time after probably over an hour and see where I'd gotten trapped, and I could see the exit was inches from me the whole time, but I couldn't see it from where I was trapped. And I had this opening where I could I had a glimpse of this self that I had realized was never damaged, it had never been broken. And so I didn't have to fix it or feel it. I could also see that the real self was already perfect and complete, and so it could not be improved upon. And so I began to realize that self-improvement was an oxymoron, because when you really understand the nature of the self, you can see that you can't improve upon it. And, in fact, Michelangelo is noted to have said that how he created his great sculptures was that he believed that the divine created everything already and that the masterpiece was already hidden inside this block of marble. So all that Michelangelo would do was see the perfect sculpture already completed in the marble, and he would just chip away everything that wasn't it. And so he didn't believe he created anything. He believed he unleashed it or freed it from its stone from the marble. And I could see that the same principle was true for us. And I ended up pulling out of society and... I ultimately ended up cloistering myself in my apartment like a monk and going on this inner journey to understand what I had glimpsed and how dramatically it had changed my perspective on life. I could see that so much of my struggling to improve my life was actually creating most of the resistance to the life that was already in me that was naturally trying to emerge. I could see that just as the oak tree is already in the acorn, and the acorn doesn't have to go out and attract an oak or achieve an oak or make an oak happen, that when the acorn surrenders to the soil and the conditions in the soil match the seed pattern already in the shell, that the oak naturally emerges. And that that same principle was true for us, that there's already a perfect pattern of infinite potential planted in the soil of our soul. And when we cultivate the right and the right conditions that match that seed, it naturally emerges in our life in general, but also in any specific area that we're working with. And that is where the law of emergence was born and where I began to move out of my struggling with self-improvement and instead into a life of self-emergence. Awesome. Now, in your book, I know you talk about how self-improvement, and I totally get where you're coming from, I totally agree, you say it's different from personal development. How do you see them um, differing, and how does the law of emergence fit into all that? So self-improvement, typically when we're trying to improve ourselves or we're trying to attract things or we're trying to fix and change ourselves, it's often coming from a misperception of the self. It's coming from a premise of the self that is that it's somehow damaged, broken, lacking, something's missing, something's wrong. And that is fundamentally a flawed premise or flawed self-concept. Even if we do all the right things, as the old metaphysical axiom says, to he or she who is wrong in mind, they can do all the right things and it will still turn out wrong. But to he or she who is right in mind, they can do all the wrong things and it will still turn out right. So when you come from a premise that you're broken, damaged, lacking, something's wrong, and you're going to try to improve yourself, you end up manifesting more of that false or limited self-concept. It's kind of like you know trying to dig yourself out of a hole. The more you dig, the deeper in the hole you get. And that's why so many people experience, the more they try to attract or achieve or improve their life, the more frustrated and the more struggle they experience. And often, they have less and less of what they're trying to experience. And even in the best case scenarios, from the false premise that you're broken or something's lacking, you can manifest a bigger paycheck, but you'll often find yourself just broke at a higher income bracket. Or you manifest a new relationship and you have the same argument. So personal development, where you're trying to develop certain parts of you in contrast, that's more relating to, let's just say, you want to become a better writer. So you recognize that you're not expressing your full potential. It's like the acorn. You know, the acorn is not an inadequate oak tree. You know what I'm saying? The acorn is a perfect acorn, but it also has a whole lot more potential in it. So wherever we find ourselves, 
we're not an inadequate or diminished version of our future self. We're a perfect version of our current self. But there's still so much more in us, so much more potential. If we're, if we're let's say, like I said, we want to be a writer, and we're writing at a certain level right now, there's so much more potential in us to develop. So knowing that, we can develop that potential, but we're not doing it from the standpoint that something's missing, that something's wrong, that something's lacking. We're doing it from the standpoint of there's so much unexpressed potential in me. And that can include the emergence process that I talk about in my free training and in my book, and we'll obviously go into more today. But it can also, it also can include specific paths of study, you know, like literally studying to be a good writer. Or if you're trying to get in better shape, you know, studying the body and working with a trainer. And all of those are wonderful things. That's personal development. But you just want to make sure you're, you're doing it from the standpoint of understanding you're learning these skills, you're developing these potentials because it's already in you, not because you're trying to attract it or achieve it or add something that you don't have. That's the key. That's, that's the key distinction. Absolutely. That's a really great way of putting it. So thank you. I think that just that concept alone is going to really unlock things for some people listening. So that's great. And Absolutely. I'm also curious. So you mentioned a couple of times in, in your bio, your book title, and even while speaking about the law of emergence. So can you tell us what that's about? Well, yeah. So the law of emergence is what I described before, which is just as the oak tree is already in the acorn or any plant is already in the seed, and that seed doesn't attract the plant or achieve the plant, when the plant, or the seed rather, is planted in the soil and the conditions in the soil match the pattern in the seed, what's already in it naturally emerges. And so even when a farmer or gardener is working on a garden or a farm, they know that they don't make the plant happen. A little bit more mature in terms of understanding the principles of creation, we start to realize there really isn't an attraction, even though that's what it looks like at this level. Now, the reason why this is important and why it's not just semantics is that, as I've already been talking about, when you come from a frame of mind where you're trying to attract something, you are in a, a mindset that's already incongruent with the truth about you. You're, you're already saying that something's missing, something's mm -hmm. lacking. I don't have it. As it says in the Bible, to he who has, more shall be given. But to he who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. And so... It's all about a state of having consciousness. You know, the great mystical statement, I am. It doesn't say I was. It doesn't say I will be. It says I am. I am, I have, it's happening now. That's the state of consciousness that is congruent with our true nature, which is that we do have it all and it is happening. So when we're using the law of attraction to attract, we're already stepping outside of and we're trying to fix a self that doesn't actually exist. It's a fictional construct in our mind. Because there is no such self that's lacking anything. The only self that there is is the self that already has it all. It's forever unfolding and emerging in time and space through this process of emergence. And again, you know, when we try to attract stuff, even if we will ourselves into a better life, we often bring with us that, that limited self-concept. And so we end up attracting more problems or a more exacerbated version of our inadequacies. And that's why, again, so many people struggle with trying to improve their lives because they're starting off from a premise that's already flawed, which is that they're broken or that they're lacking or that something's missing or something's wrong. And the, the starting point for all true growth and progress is I'm already whole and complete. I already have it all. Now let me find a way to release this which is already in me, as the poet Robert Browning called it, the imprisoned splendor. I love that. And, you know, the thing is, I think just operating from the premise of I have everything I need, it just makes life funner because with the whole self-improvement or law of attraction, it's just it's never really ending. You can't ever really appreciate that current moment. Yes. So I adore what you're saying, and just to kind of take this into super practical terms, you're talking about somebody who might want more abundance, how um, they would think a certain way and just have certain conversations. Can you also walk us through some steps they can take if someone's trying to bring more abundance into their life or more abundance? Absolutely, and I, and I am going to give everybody a free access to an entire video training on emergence as well. 
So stay tuned, and we'll, we'll give you that link to that uh, that I've created just to sort of celebrate the launch of my new book on emergence, which is being released. Depending on when you're listening to this, it's probably already in stores, and you can get it right away. The fundamental thing is that it's already in you. You have to become aligned with it, and you want to stop waiting for conditions to change before you will be capable or ready or able to have the life that you want. You want to start stepping into that life now. And I, I remember one personal example of this was when my first child was born and we, me and my wife lived in a small apartment and we wanted, you know, a home to have our child grow up in. And we couldn't afford a home. We couldn't even begin to afford a home. And so most people would kind of stop there. They certainly wouldn't go out and start looking for home. Having begun to understand this principle, I knew that that inner desire for the home, understand that desire from the emergence model is not a sign of what's outside of you that you have to go get. It's a sign of what's inside of you trying to get out. In fact, the word desire comes from a root that means of the sire or of the father or of the creative principle or also from the heavens. So that burning desire you have for more abundance or more whatever that you're trying to do in your life right now, that's a clue of what's already been activated inside of you. You're actually pregnant with it, and it's trying to emerge in your life. And so I began to recognize this, that that beautiful dream home was already happening. We needed to become congruent to it. So we did a few things. The first thing we did, and this is a principle, it's part of the practice, is rather than looking at our current place and making it not good enough, we started to treat it as if it was the home of our dreams. We started to show up and bring the quality and the feeling and the conversation and the activity into that home as if it was the home of our dreams. And I did this also with a job that I had that I hated. So a lot of you might be in jobs that you don't like or relationships that you don't like or environments that you don't like. So you begin to get a sense of what is the vision of what it is trying to emerge. What is that burning desire? Define that vision. Create it. Write it down. And then ask, if I was living that vision fully, who would I be and how would I feel and how would I talk? And begin to ask, how can I bring that into my current home, job, relationship? And as we began to do that, we began to really treat this home as if it was our dream home. We began to take care of it, appreciate the little things. We, we painted the walls, brought in fresh flowers, whatever we could afford, which was not very much. And we just began to treat it as if we were already in our dream home. You know, we also use certain practices that many of you are aware of, like visualization and things. Not so much to make that vision happen, but to get into the vibrational match, to live in that feeling tone that it was already happening. And then the third step is action. So the first step is vision. The second step is congruent. The third step is action. We began to say if we will really believe that this was true, what else would we do? And we realized, well, we would start looking for our perfect home. So while we were treating our existing home as if it was our dream home, we also began to look for our home as if we could afford it. And we started to shop for it and go hang out in the, the model homes, have picnics in the park, in the neighborhood where we wanted to live. We began to live into the vision as much as we could. And then we'd go home to our current apartment, and we would treat it with respect and gratitude, and we would bring the joy and the aliveness and the creativity that we thought we would have if we were living in our dream home. And at first, there was a lot of contrast, a lot of incongruence. You know, we would leave the model home feeling so inspired, come back to our little apartment and feel like, oh, God, this place is terrible. And then we knew we had to do more work, and we would build that inner congruence go back to the model homes and come back home again. And I remember one day we crossed over the threshold and the feeling was the same. It felt like we were living in our dream home. I mean, I felt like I was home. And interestingly, the need for another home fell away. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about. Because if you're really believing that you're in your dream home, wherever it is, then how do you – Like, I was curious about how you could then start to even want to do other things. Like, I want – do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, so, so ultimately it fell away. I was at peace. We were content. We were grateful. And then a few days later, I had a breakthrough. And within about a month and a half after that, we were moving into our dream. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about the breakthrough? Well, it was basically that, remember when I talked about the radio station that, you know, your music is playing on a certain station, and when you tune into it, you know, the music's already there. Well, imagine there's two stations. One is K-R-I-C-H, K-Rich, and the other one is K-L-A-C-K, K-Lack. 
And, you know, a lot of us are tuned in, when we're tuned into KLAC, we're looking at what's missing, we're focused on the problem. The kind of information that comes over that station, it's congruent with that station. It's probably, they're probably playing the blues, they're probably have a lot of gossip and negative talk radio. But on K-Rich, it's a very different programming. They're talking about much more empowering stuff, much more inspiring stuff, and a lot of different kind of people listen to that station. So when you tune into the station that's congruent with your vision, you're on a bandwidth that is a match for a level of knowledge, insight, and inspiration that you are otherwise, you don't have access to. So because I was now tuned in to that station of abundance and of the station of the dream home and the station of gratitude, I now have access to a whole different bandwidth of knowledge, information, inspiration, and ideas that I could not access otherwise. And in that breakthrough, it was like all of a sudden, this veil parted, and I could see that we could afford it and that we would afford it. I could see how it would be possible. Whereas before I was blind, now I could see. And it was like a blinding awareness. I was like, oh, my God, it's done. And interestingly, I talked about Michelangelo in the beginning of this. In writing his biography, the, one of the biographers talked about when he sculpted the great sculpture of David, you know, David and Goliath. He didn't sculpt David in the moment that David slew Goliath or after he slayed Goliath. He sculpted David in the moment when David knew that he could and that he would slay Goliath. Mm. In that moment, David became congruent with the vision. And in that moment, even though he hadn't even stepped a foot on the battlefield, Goliath was already a goner. In that moment, his destiny was sealed. For me, in that moment when the congruence happened, I already had my home. And then all of a sudden, the insight broke through, the awareness, the guidance, the path, and everything unfolded from there. Well, and how long was that total process from starting to when you got it? You know, it was probably less than 90 days. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, again, I did the same thing when I was working at a job that I hated. I was a waiter. Did all the same things, brought all of that excellence and leadership, and I brought the person I wanted to be to that job. And I got fired from that job three times. Every time I got fired, they hired me back because they realized that I hadn't done anything. It was a mistake. Finally, the third time I, I got fired, I stayed fired. And I realized that what was happening was that every time I raised my vibrational set point, it was becoming a, a mismatch for that environment. And so that environment kept spinning me out. And that's the interesting thing about this work is as you become a match for your, your vision, by showing up fully, one of two things will happen. That environment or that person will change to match you or you will be moved to a person, place, or thing that matches you. Exactly. And I got, you know, finally fired that third time, and within a few weeks, I got hired again somewhere else, and I went from working in a three-star restaurant waiting on other people to being wined and dined in five-star restaurants around the country, and I went from making $50 a day to making $1,000 a day, doing work that I loved, work that was more congruent, work that was a match for who I was showing up in life as. It's important that, to know that that didn't happen in my future. That happened right there on the job that I hated by me showing up as if it was the job of my dreams and bringing that energy and those qualities and that congruence. And so ultimately in our life, this is why I call the process emergeneering because it's about engineering the emergence of your life, engineering a strategy that makes you a match for your vision so that you begin to surround yourself inside and out with the people, places, conversations, ideas, and activities that represent where you want to go, not where you've been. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you become a match, and that which is inherent and innate within you naturally emerges. Mm -hmm. I love that. So how does that apply into what you're saying about whatever is missing is what we're not giving? Well, it applies very much so because – what a normal average person would do in that situation is complain about the job, you know, or complain about not having enough money to afford a house or whatever the situation is, and they would react to the situation and see themselves as a victim and see their situation as lacking and see their condition as a cause rather than seeing it as an effect and recognizing that they are the source of everything. That when you walk into a room or into a job or into a relationship, the only thing you can need is what you bring because you are the source. Now, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but there's a mystical truth here, and that is that you're not really in the world. 
the whole world is in you. It's in your consciousness. And what you're seeing and experiencing are really dimensions and expressions of your own consciousness. Nothing happens outside of your consciousness. There's no way to get outside of your consciousness. And so you are the only cause unto your experience. And once you understand that and you understand that you have everything already in you, then you begin to understand life doesn't happen to you. It can only happen through you and as you. And that what you're waiting for, you're waiting with and you're weighing it down. And this is the ultimate weight loss program, you know, W-A-I-T. And so you begin to say, if you find yourself going, I wish there was more respect here, then guess who has to start generating more respect? You do. And so you begin to first generate it for yourself. So if you're waiting for someone else to respect you, you have to ask, if I deeply and completely respected myself or valued or loved myself, how would I hold myself? How would I be? What would I do? What would I say? And you have to begin to step into that generating self-respect, filling yourself up with the qualities that appear to be missing. That's the first step. And this is the law of circulation because you can't give what you don't have. So you have to first activate it within yourself. Fill yourself up with it. Whatever you're trying to get from someone, fill yourself up with it. Give it to yourself. Then you cannot keep what you don't give. So now you have to start radiating it, circulating it. So wherever you're trying to get that from someone, you now start giving it. You start bringing it. You start respecting them more, valuing them more, loving them more. Not to get anything from them, but because it's all in you. The only way more can come into your life is if more life comes out of you. So when you start filling yourself up and then filling others up and filling your environment up, lo and behold, you watch as people start treating you differently and then things start showing up and that state of consciousness that you're now generating begins to clothe itself in terms of form and experience. Mm, that makes a total sense. And I can see, for example, if someone is wanting to get into a relationship with being loving themselves and then radiating that out. And if they want the same more wealth and abundance, would that be even if they can't necessarily create more money, which is kind of what you're talking about with the house, is just really appreciating what you have and really feeling the abundance of that? Yes, that's a huge part of it. And you can always, because wealth isn't dollar bills. Dollar bills are a symbol of wealth, but they are not the source of wealth. Your consciousness is the source of our wealth, our supply. Even if you don't have much money, you can always give something, even if it's just a dime or a nickel to charity or to whatever, just to start getting the money flowing. It's called tithing. You know, you can certainly give, even if it's a little bit, that gets circulating. But you can also give compliments. You can give support. You can give love. You can give blessings. You can want the best for everyone. And as you start to pray and affirm and forgive and love and serve, you are activating that divine substance. And it starts flowing into your life. You start feeling more abundant. As you start activating more gratitude, the universe starts giving you more reasons to be grateful. You know, I'm curious because I know a lot of people identify with being overgivers. And they feel like they're always just... Yes. How does that apply to this? Now, that gets into a deeper element, which I do, I do go into in the video training about the shadows. When people are overgiving, it's because they have a shadow around being selfish. They have a mask or an identity around, if I just give and give and give, somebody's going to eventually take care of me or give it back to me, or I'm a good person when I'm giving and I'm not a good person if I'm receiving. So there's a, there's a deeper work that has to be understood there. And again, I do go into that in the emergence video training. But one of the things to understand is that in that situation, remember, it's not about just giving to others. In the giving cycle, the first step is you want to be giving to yourself. So the law of circulation says you cannot give what you don't have, and you cannot keep what you don't give, and you cannot sustain what you don't receive. So it's a complete cycle. It's like people that just overgive are people that are always trying to breathe out, but they're not breathing in. And you can imagine how good that's going to go down. So it's one full breath. You can only breathe out as much as you're willing to breathe in. And you can only breathe in as much as you breathe out. So it's not separate. Giving and receiving are one and the same. If, if you're giving and giving and giving and you're feeling kind of burned out, overwhelmed, resentful, why are they not giving to me, why me, you want to look at, again, what seems to be missing. If you could give voice to it, well, I wish they would just give me some more appreciation. I wish they would just give me credit. I wish they would just give me acknowledgement. I wish they would whatever. 
you have to go back to that first question I said is, if I loved, valued, appreciated, and respected myself, how would I treat myself? What would I do today? How would I hold myself today? How would I be in this relationship? And as you ask that with sincerity, you'll start to get guidance that will have you having different conversations. It will, you'll suddenly get the guidance that says, you know, when they ask you to do this thing for them, the guidance says, say no. And you're like, oh my God, but if I say no, they're going to get, they're going to think I'm terrible and selfish and all that. If you honor that guidance, that's the beginning of you truly respecting and valuing and filling yourself up. And the result of that is you'll start to heal that overwhelm and that resentment. And eventually, because people treat us the way we train them to treat us, based on how we treat ourselves, as we start to treat ourselves as the priceless, beautiful being that we are, then the world starts to treat us that way as well. That's such a great answer. Thank you. I'm also curious, when you're telling people about the law of emergence and just the general principles you believe in, what are the biggest objections? Do people ever say, I don't believe this because? The, you know, obviously the biggest objections are, how can you say that I'm, there's nothing wrong with me or there's nothing missing? I mean, just look at my life. <laughs> it's a mess. And I can say, yes, there's a difference between life and life experience. Life experience is based on your perception. We don't get what we want or what we believe. We don't get what's true necessarily. We get what we believe, what we perceive. So our experience is a relative projection of the infinite perfection. And so our experience may look really bad, but that doesn't have anything to do with truth. It just has to do with what we've been believing and accepting and perceiving. So one of the biggest challenges is that we judge by appearances, how we've been conditioned. That's why the great teachers said, do not judge by appearances. That's what all the great master teachers have taught. Because when you judge by appearances, you're just judging based on an old belief, an old idea, an old projection. And underneath that, there's an infinite perfection that's trying to emerge. That's one of the big objections, obviously. People are like, look at my life. It's terrible. How can you say this, that I'm perfect? And again, I just say that's just an old projection. That's not at all the truth about you. The perfection within you is still intact and whole and complete. And when you do this work, it will begin to emerge in your life as if you never lost anything because in truth you didn't. I would say one of the other ones would be, uh, which we've touched upon, is, well, if everything's in me, what does that mean? That there's a bunch of dollar bills in me, there's a bunch of jobs inside of me. You know, people don't quite understand what they take it literally instead of spiritually or energetically. And so it's important to know that life is not material. Life is not physical. We even know this now in quantum physics. All that appears physical and material is concentrated light, concentrated energy, or even at the purest level, it's just pure consciousness. We're not trying to generate planes, trains, and automobiles out of our consciousness. We're generating the frequency and the energy, which is the real substance the real essence and the real nature of creation. And then that gets interpreted according to our unique pattern and our unique needs. And it shows up as the different forms and functions of this world. But we have to begin to retrain ourselves to think spiritually, to think energetically, to think symbolically, and to develop our soul senses rather than our physical senses. Because our physical senses will always lie to us. It's like, you know, a snail... If you sit in front of a snail and you move, like, away from the snail and then come back again to the snail, it looks like you just disappeared or something because its, it's frequency of perception is so slow. The similar thing is true with us. Our ability to perceive reality is it's so much slowed down in our physical senses that we can't perceive that actually the whole universe is literally turning on and off a million times a second like on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And in every one of those milliseconds where it turns off and turns on again, we can literally recreate our whole life. But we're judging by the senses, which are very slow compared to reality. And so that's why everything feels solid and looks solid and sounds the way it does. And that's good because that's how we get to experience this world. But we, as we do this work, we retrain ourselves to sense more intuitively into the deeper nature of life. And that takes some time and some practice, but even before we're able to see and sense into all of that, if we just follow these simple steps, we'll begin to activate our emerging power. That makes total sense. And 
One thing that I love to ask the guests, and I'm very curious what your answer is going to be about this, but, you know, I feel like we're all, you know, we all humans, and we all are working, I don't want to say towards something, but we're all, I feel like we're always evolving. For you, what's something that you're working on right now, not working on in the, in the context of self-improvement, but what's your next thing that you're working towards, and how are you getting through it? How are you making that happen? Gosh, there's so many things that are unfolding in my life. You know, for me right now, from a personal development, consciousness development state, there's four stages in spiritual growth and development. There's the first stage where you believe you're a victim of life and life is happening to you. And then you realize certain principles that allow you to create, manifest. And you move into the second stage where you realize you're a creator, a manifester, and now you are happening to life. But that's very limited by our own ego and personality. And so eventually you move into, and that's where law of attraction exists. You, you realize that there's something bigger trying to happen through you. And you have to let go of control and move into the third stage, which is where you realize life is happening not to you. And you are not happening to life, but life is happening through you and as you. And that's where the law of emergence lives. And then finally, you have to let go of even a personal sense of itself apart from life. And you move into the fourth stage where you realize life is happening as you. That's the stage where it is I am. So I would say for me, there's been a profound shift in surrender and letting go of control. Just a deepening of letting go of my ideas and agendas of what I think should or shouldn't be and surrendering in a deeper way to what's trying to emerge in my life that is beyond what I can imagine. And that's another just a key distinction is that just as the acorn can't, if an acorn had a, an identity, a personality, it really couldn't imagine what life's going to be like as an oak tree. The acorn, if it had its own way, would just try to create a better and better acorn life. But when it allows the process of emergence to happen and its protective shell to crack away, something much bigger than it could ever imagine, something much bigger than its acorn identity emerges. Same thing with the caterpillar and the butterfly. So as we grow along this path, and again, that's kind of where I'm at right now, I'm surrendering all of my ideas even of what I think should or shouldn't unfold to begin to open up to this bigger emerging impulse that is happening on the planet right now and happening in human consciousness so that I can be an even purer instrument of it. That would be where I'm at right now. That doesn't mean that I I still don't have a lot of things I want. It's just that I'm practicing letting go of that and opening up to what wants me, what the universe wants to express for me. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Are you still wanting things? Interesting. That's something I think I'm going to have to think about for a little bit, just digesting all that. I mean, I get the concept and everything, but I'm also just curious how it would affect to be friendly in stage four one's just daily life on a what is there to want kind of basis. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's the thing, and that's the ego will trick us into thinking, well, if I don't want anything, then I'm just going to end up doing nothing and becoming nothing and having nothing, and what's the point? But actually, the exact opposite is true. The more I've surrendered, the more I've let go of control, the more has emerged in my life. Because the universe isn't neutral. Remember, again, when that seed surrenders to the soil, it's not like nothing happens. That's when the work really starts happening. That's when its real destiny starts emerging. So when you are free of, the, of, of attachment, when you no longer, as Buddha taught, you no longer have craving or aversion, meaning you're not trying to get, 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 or trying to get rid of in order to be happy and secure, but rather you've come to a place of stillness and of completeness and of peace. You don't become static. You don't become nothing. You become one with everything, and then that whole abundance of life now gets to express through you without any of the resistance and express through you in a way that's beyond and bigger than you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Because, because life, you are a place where the whole universe is conspiring to fulfill itself, to put itself on display. We talk about like the will of God or the will of life. It's to have more and more of life expressed. When we desire stuff from the old space of thinking that we don't have it, then we take ourselves out of alignment with this natural flow. But when we understand desire in the right context, where desire is just an emerging impulse, it's just telling us what's trying to emerge in us. We're not attached to it. We don't struggle with it. We just allow it. And then it, it unfolds and it unfolds and it unfolds 
often before we can even want it, before we can figure out how to get it, it just begins to unfold. Great point, great point. And as you're talking, I'm thinking there's definitely points in my life where I have just let go on way better than I could have expected, you know, and just kind of let things flow. I'm thinking particularly in my romantic relationships with my ex, I actually had a, a list of like 40 points of things that I wanted in a guy. Right. And very specific. So sight, he has to have the color eyes, all this stuff. And I got that, and it was exactly what I wanted, and then I thought he was my ex. And then when I just kind of opened it up to how I'd like to feel about all the crazy criteria, I just found somebody who consistently blows my mind every day. Yes. Beautiful. That's exactly it. And again, it doesn't mean you can't embrace the things you want, that you can't embrace certain specifics in life. You just don't become attached to them. Right. You know, you say, I'm willing to have this or better for the highest good of all concerned, so that you're open to the good, you're open to more good than you can imagine, and it's like, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's like, God, if there's any way I can get out of this, and I'm not have to go, like, to the cross and do all this crazy stuff, uh, that would be really cool. But then he follows it up and says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so in today's parlance, that would be, Hey, if I cannot have to go through this struggle, that would be awesome. I'm totally up for not having the struggle. Or if I could have this beautiful, great thing, I'm totally willing to have all this great stuff. So I'm open to a life free of struggle and abundance and all that. Nevertheless, I'm not going to hold on to that because I don't humanly know what's best for me. I'm going to surrender my ideas and I'm going to yield to the larger intelligence that's running the show here and let it have its way and work its magic through me. So that's just another way of saying, thy will be done, knowing that the will of life, the will of the universe, is always for a better and better and better expression of life, always. Mm -hmm. And it just sometimes, our egoic, limited perspective can blind us from that, and, you know, and we don't really know what's best for us. We think it's best, but we don't realize it's just conditioning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this has been awesome. I think that you shared so many just new frameworks for people to think about and really great practical action steps that people can apply. So thank you so much. I would love if you could just let people know where they can go to find the free video training and anywhere else you want to let them know. To get the free in-depth emergence training, you just go to www.emergencetraining.com. So that's www.emergence training, our one word, emergencetraining.com. If you want to get the book and also $1,791 in bonus programs and support, you just go to getemergencebook.com and you can buy the book wherever books are sold. But if you go to getemergencebook.com, Dot com. You can also learn how to get all the bonuses and a video there that talks about the book and all that. So emergencetraining.com and getemergencebook.com and you get a bunch of free bonuses and also a really in-depth training. Great. Well, thank you again, Derek. Thank you. It's been my true honor and pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to A Better Life. You can find all show notes for this episode at rachelrofay.com. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe so you can automatically get access to all new shows. Let's also connect. Just go on to Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram slash Rachel Rose, and we can talk there. The opinions of all guests here are their own, and I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them. I do want to give you a perspective, though. And always remember, if you have a choice, choose a better life.